papers are, and we found all the original drawings for the building. And it was, as was illustrated here, it was a very beautiful red brick building, very Victorian, with very sculpted cast iron piers in columns. And we thought, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could bring some of this back? But none of it is there. It was really re-skinned. And the only original facade that remains that was lean out sign is actually on the service side of the 18th Street side of the building. But these are the original uh, drawings by the architects. We also learned that he had done an alternative plan for the building, which had a similar base space and window openings, but included a roof above the top um, family. So then we knew the building had been reskinned in the 1920s on the Broadway side, the Chamfer Corner, and the um, 17th Street side, and they had removed some other elements. Originally, there had been a two-story glass and metal piece at the corner. That was removed, and a more ornamental, single-story entrance was put at the chamber. At the time of designation, the building was pretty much the same massing um, with this buff-colored brick. The remaining from that left me now day, um, architectural ornament is this terracotta band at the top, and the Aquaferia scalloped edge at the very top of the building, there's a very flat metal, what I think is an encasement of what was probably a more fragile um, scalloped edge ornamental piece. So that the profile remains, but the sculptural elements are not seen. And at the time of the renovation, they had installed decorative metal in the transoms. They had put very high solid um, bulkheads within these different areas. And they had turned these into windows and put the door at the corner so that it didn't have the variety of entrances available on 17th Street anymore. But in doing all of this research, we then went back to the designation report to look at what was the story of the site. And the site, actually, had been owned by the same family for many, many years. The parishes. And they, they built this building. It had originally been their home. There had been a small building on the corner, which had a sort of interesting mansardish kind of addition put onto it. And it became the Union Club. The great thing about this location is that it's incredibly well documented. There's all the parades and all the ceremonial aspects. So you can see the original mansion from this era and then an addition that was put on the corner. So the reason that we came to feeling that modification of the building might actually be in line with the history of the site is that this is a site that has had for over 100 years many different additions, changes, etc. And last but not least, that left me now had his office in the building. So we thought that this was an opportunity to take that flying leap and see if there was an appropriate rooftop addition that might be possible on the building. So we'll take away all the history. And the other part of it is that when we were first asked to look at the building, we were presented with the usual zoning diagrams that show the available square footage, which is approximately 12,000 square feet of undeveloped um, development rights. And the um, zoning analysis showed a four-story box sitting on top of the building. 
well, we advise the owners, four stories is never going to happen. <laughs> and we said, but let's see if there's another way to do this. So we put the two-story box on the building, and we modeled it. And we could see the two-story box from everywhere. And I said, maybe this is not the location where you do the sort of um, bobble on top of the building, but you look for a more demure type of addition that's really more contextual and something that really looks like it belongs to the district and the building that it's part of. So what we're proposing. This is the existing ground floor plan. And the proposed ground floor plan maintains the current lobby, but we're adding an elevator, which will have an impact as we go up. All the other floors remain the same. And then at the rooftop, the current rooftop has a stair and elevator bulkhead and another mechanical bulkhead on the 18th Street side. This is 17th, this is Broadway. And what we're proposing is to fill out um, with a seventh floor. And an eighth floor. And these are all sided toward the south side of the building, fronting on 17th Street. And there's, there's a method to this madness, too. Um, the building actually sits in two different zoning districts. The 18th Street side is a manufacturing district, which does not permit residential. The two additional floors that we are proposing are residential floors for the owners of the building. So these are not condominiums. They're just home by um, And in order to do this, the last bit is to provide the additional stair bulkheads and elevator bulkhead and new mechanical which is sitting further away. What does it look like? So from the south elevation along 17th Street, as Caroline said, what we're proposing is to replace existing um, decorative grillage with new grillage and a similar grillage at the bulkheads below the display windows and pairs of doors, and a new pair of doors at the chamfered corner to replace the sort of low trans and more industrial doors that have been located here. And then above the terracotta and aquaferia band is a new mansard roof, which is very traditional, very um, contextual to the type of Parisian mansards that you see, which does the same sort of stepping from a larger bank of windows for solid in a more dormer configuration to a more transparent one. And what we're proposing for materials is a terracotta rain screen, both to relate to the bands and the remaining terracotta, but also because in the sections that we're looking at, we can get a little bit more softness and a little bit more layering of materials by using either baguette or rod type installation over that kind of material. We have three different sections. Um, on the Broadway side, again replacing the doorways and windows, so that they're a little bit lacier, relate more to the original right now um, design, and then extending up to the mansard on this side. The remaining we have design facade on 18th Street remains intact, and the addition, which is set roughly 100 feet back from the street, the box up above. Are you going to move that drawing so that you can see the two together? Of course. What is that brown mass behind the man's side group? That dark brown. Those are the tops of the wall fence. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, oh the stairs. The stairs. The and those are not. 
that's an existing one. There's, where's this section? Square. 
Square, our site right at the corner, which goes from 17 to 18, and the district boundary, which carves around this way, and the different individuals that sit around the, the square. It's visible. We do not dispute this is a very visible rooftop addition. But we felt that it could be an appropriate approach to play this in this form rather than try to make it a shiny, sparkly. So if this is the view close up of the building and the view of the building with the Mansard addition. And as we walk down Union Square West, a little further away, we see how it blends in. And as we go further away, you see how, at least in our eye, it blends in while not obscuring the more prominent buildings, especially to the north. There are some extremely fine buildings as you look north of Broadway, and these can still be visible. And then moving to the west, looking to the east on 17th Street, and looking to the west. And then the view on Broadway looking south where you can see the entire side wall. Um, that is where the extension is the, the plane brick of a secondary facade. And then looking from the southwest corner back toward the site. And these are from the east. The existing, the proposed, and the existing, the proposed. Okay. Okay. I stepped out of the room Sorry. Okay, we forgot. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, it's, its architecture may have sort of toned itself down. It became the third factory, and this was in Warhol's office. It was the nightclub, it was the factory. And so historically, it's a very interesting place. Thank you. Question? Anyone? <laughs> Pretty, um, that was a showstopper at the end. <laughs> Mm -hmm. There it is. Okay. We can go right to testimony. Right? That's fine. Then we'll come back to you. Okay. Jack Taylor. Capitol Building that had long since disappeared. 
In the end, faced with the probability of strong public disapproval and the likelihood of commission rejection, the applicant withdrew the proposal literally an hour before the public hearing. The architect was James Stewart Poultry. We wish the current applicant had done the same. This proposal involves much more than just the building itself. It would dramatically alter the historic skyline of the north side of Union Square, which has remained substantially intact and impressive since 1911, when the Guardian Life building was constructed. With one minor exception, that skyline is comprised entirely of designated buildings, three of them individually landmark, and two of them, two of them, including, of course, 860 Broadway, are in the Ladies Mile Star District. There are two Ladies Mile buildings facing the north end of Union Square. In addition, there is the wondrous view corridor up Broadway from Union Square to Madison Square, the heart of the original Ladies Mile that would be affected by this proposal, obscuring, especially from some angles, the spires of the McIntyre building at 18th Street. Go back to our comparison of the current application with the one involving the Siegel Cooper building. Here, too, there is a quid pro quo. In return for approval of the highly visible rooftop construction, the applicant offers to restore the configurations of the 17th Street facade that were lost in alterations made in 1925. In the book that we published in 1986, as part of our request for evaluation and the lobbying effort to achieve a lady's mile historic history, we paid particular attention to what the designation report describes as the commanding presence of 860 Broadway, devoting a full page to the 1883 plan of its celebrated architect, Tetla Freeman. We are all in favor of the restorative aspects of the application performance, but not at the cost of a rooftop enlargement that we consider insensitive and inappropriate to the historic district, the building itself, and the famous square of the face. Thank you. Thank you. Christabel, Carl. Christabel, Carl, from the Society for the Architecture of the City. New York has not been kind to the work of the death of the Born abroad, a student of the Bruce, he taught Gartenberg and built the foremost landowners of his time. But because the locations he helped to make fashionable were so often redeveloped, say the Avenue of 10th Street and later the Avenue of 56th Street, it is mainly his downtown commercial buildings that still exist, like the present item 860 Broadway. Avery Library has preserved the original design which you have been shown. So we already know how much we've lost in the pre-designation alterations. But the present application would completely obliterate what little is left of the original design that is the massive. Lino designed smaller buildings with mansards, which in no way resembled what is called a mansard here. The massing of 860 Broadway is simple, and to the degree that such an irregular site can be, it is classical in the loose sense. The lost detailing was elegant and restrained and is not proposed to be adequately recreated, not at all in the middle section. The building occupies a key location in the view of Broadway from Union Square, and the proposed addition would interfere with our perception of R. H. Robertson's wonderful McIntyre building, and I do not believe that the boards of you show sufficiently portray that. The McIntyre building 
its tower rising through the still preserved low scale of small commercial buildings along Broadway. All of these magical surviving roof lines are proposed to be wrecked through a self-serving rationale that advances examples of other buildings and other locations that have men sites or other directly reflected roof lines. In 1955, coached by Talbot Hamlin and Alan Burnham, the second executive director of this commission, Alan Kramer wrote in the Society of Architectural Historians Journal that Lena's subdued and elegant designs were little recognized now, that's in 1955, but functioned as a forerunner of the American Renaissance that flourished after his death. It would be unfortunate if this rare example of his work, a major building in a prominent location, lost its original massing without even the concession of a full restoration of its crudely modernized facade. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara, say. The North End of Union Square is a treasure trove of individual landmarks and buildings within the Ladies Nile Historic District. While 860 Broadway has endured some sad alterations to its facades, particularly the loss of most of its original neo greek ornament, its prominent cornice remains a signature component of the building and an in intact feature that should be recognized and preserved. The enormous addition being proposed on this very visible splayed corner building threatens to transform the graceful cornice into nothing but a gutter for a historically misguided 21st century landslide roof. The cornice was intended to be the building's apex and crown, not the base for another structure to overshadow and overwhelm it. It might be tempting to look to the Guardian Life building, currently the W Hotel, at Union Square East, as inspiration for a mansard roof atop 860 Broadway. However, the Guardian Life Building's grand four-story mansard is original to the building, proportional to its 20-story composition, and appropriate to the overall design of the building, which elsewhere features ornamental cartouches and garlands in the French style. The bulky mansard roof on 860 Broadway would make the building roughly 30% taller, becoming an affront to the building and to the streetscapes on both East 17th Street and Broadway. HDC finds the lack of a setback to be particularly egregious, as such an obtrusive intervention would appear as though it was purporting to be an original component of the building's design, rather than a necessary fixture deferring to its historic setting. HDC asks that the Commission reject this proposal and preserve the extant cornice and proportions of 860 Broadway. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Leo Black. Um, Chairman, Committee and Commissioners, I'm Leo uh, Blackman, Vice President, President of the Drive for the Ladies Mile, and an architect who lives and works on either side of the historic district. Because 860 Broadway is so prominent, uh, exposed on two elevations, visible across Union Square, and the gateway to the protected part of Broadway, it seems important to get this one right. Uh, in addition, the building we now see is remodeling of an even grander one. I understand that an earlier iteration of this proposal caused call for adding even more floors to the existing structure. The current drawings show a two-story addition in the form of a mansard. While the suggested bulk may not seem unreasonable, there are a few precedents in the district, and there are a few uh, precedents in the district for later expansions up, and even a couple of original mansards on the north side of Union Square. This project does not sit well. The failure, unfortunately, is in the architecture. The proposal seems fussy in a way that calls attention to itself rather than the landmark. The dorms appear weighty, the texture of the roof is unclear, and the ornamental efforts are clumsy. Either a more thoughtful, proportionate interpretation of the past, or a lighter, simpler, more modern addition would result in a more successful and appropriate topping here. But one last item on the storefront. While the proportions of the 1925 display windows and grill covered transoms may be squat, we hope the staff will assist the applicant retaining as much original fabric as possible and detailing new work to withstand the close scrutiny of passers by. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other testimony? waited for the objection sheet <laughs> to be able to come forward. 
Um, because we wanted to confirm that the approach to using a Mansard type roof was a mass and that's acceptable to the city and they confirmed that. Um, so that was the reason for the delay. And in, in our bringing the project forward. We did present the project to the community board, um, five landmarks committee back in October in preparation for the first scheduled public hearing. And they objected in discussion to the addition on principle, but they congratulated us on developing a design that we thought was the right kind of design approach for this kind of a building. And that if it weren't for two stories adding, <laughs> it might be more acceptable. We also went to consult with the Municipal Art Society's Preservation Committee because they are a wonderful group of people, much like yourselves, who give very honest appraisal of the approach. They too agreed that the architecture of the building had been long lost, that it had historic significance for many reasons, and that a two-story mansardish massing was appropriate. They found some fault with one of our first design elements, which was an attempt to recreate the two-story corner element, and then duplicate it up at the rooftop, which resulted in a very awkward um, relationship and a more prominent attention being called to the mansard. We feel that yes, this is an expansion of the building, but not 30%. It's roughly a 25% expansion in height of the building. That the form of a mansard, if you look at them in Paris, if you look at them in New York, if you look at them in Ladies Mile, is really to diminish the massing as it goes up against the skyline, which we feel this does. We also feel that by using terracotta for this, um, this mansard, rather than a standing seam or tile type roof, that we're using a material that both in color and, and in material relates to some of the most historic components of the building. I believe that it is.